Hello, my name is Matt Petrick, and we're here to talk today about a rummy history of cocktails. Um, tell you a little bit about myself, uh, and how, how it is that I'm here talking at the American Distillers Institute Conference. Um, it's a kind of an interesting path. I started uh, as a software engineer about 30 years ago, and somewhere along the way fell in love with, with uh, tiki cocktails. And from uh, tiki cocktails and starting to write about them, I got very much into rum. <clears throat> Started learning about the history of rum and different styles of rum and uh, utterly fell in love with the topic. And uh, so, you know, my blog, which was originally more about cocktails, has sort of become, uh, you know, uh, an all, all rum all the time kind of, kind of publication. Uh, besides my blog, Cocktail Wonk, I also write for other publications, including uh, Punch, Bevy, Distiller. Uh, I'm also, uh, I, know, I know there's a lot of bourbon lovers in the ADI. Uh, I also am the vintage columnist for Bourbon Plus, uh, the, where the history bug has, has uh, taken over. And so I do, a, I do a lot of digging in the archives, both for rum and for history. Um, and in 2019, uh, my wife and I quit our jobs to go pursue our dreams. Uh, and for me, that was to work full time, uh, studying uh, cocktails, spirits, writing about them, consulting with them, and so on and so forth. And our first big project was to write a book called Minimalist Tiki there. Um, it's available at minimalisttiki.com. Uh, big giant book. We'll have links again at the end. Uh, but uh, this, this was sort of our, our first stab at, at really diving into uh, tiki, tiki drinks, deconstructing tiki drinks and making them accessible to people. Um, and naturally, you know, there's a prehistory of tiki and, you know, so I've learned all about that. And in this session, we're going to <clears throat> take, a, take a sort of a spirited walk through uh, several hundred years of rum and cocktails. <clears throat> okay, so before we start that, we're just going to do a very quick uh, overview of rum history, just to set some context here, uh, put things in a time frame. Uh, you know, what, what we call rum uh, has, has, has been known by many names over the year and up to the current day. Uh, the big three, Ron, rum, rum, those are all really just uh, the, what we would call rum in different languages. So Ron is rum in Spanish, and rum with an H is rum in French. Uh, rum is English in the R-U-M, <clears throat> but then you also see rum uh, from other territories besides the Caribbean. Uh, cachaça is a Brazilian cane spirit. Um, a rock is, is essentially cane, is a Batavia rock, is essentially a cane spirit made in Indonesia uh, with a little bit of rice ferment. Um, Aguardiente de Caña is, is also a cane spirit uh, made primarily in the uh, sort of Central and South America, um, again, raw cane spirit. Uh, Claren is rum from, from Haiti, or basically a cane spirit from Haiti. Uh, Grogue is, a, is another type of cane spirit from um, some islands off the coast of Africa. Uh, <clears throat> the name escapes me at the moment, I, they shouldn't, but, but essentially rum is, rum is basically from all over the world, although the Caribbean has become sort of the center, center point of rum. Um, in terms of the, of the, you know, Caribbean basin, you know, we first saw the early cane spirits in Brazil in the, in the 1500s, uh, that's, and they evolved to today what we would call cachaça. Um, the Caribbean rum is now believed to have started around 1640 when some of the, the Dutch who were um, fleeing from uh, Brazil, and basically there were, there were Portuguese and the Dutch, uh, or coexisting in Brazil and fighting it out. And uh, the Dutch, for whatever reason, fled Brazil, <clears throat> went to one, you know, one of the nearest islands, which happened to be Barbados, uh, around uh, 1635, 1640, brought their knowledge of distillation techniques and things like that. And so Caribbean rum is now considered to be around 1630, 1640. Um, recently, historian David Wondrich, and we'll see more of him in a bit here, um, recently did research and, and has come up with some good evidence that, that cane spirits go back to even, I think it's 500, uh, 1500 years ago, again, sort of in the Southeast Asia uh, or India uh, region. So cane spirits have a very long history, but sort of the cane spirits we know today primarily centered around the Caribbean. Uh, and, and so, you know, and we, as you'll see, 
that that it wasn't for too long after that that people started you know stop just drinking rum you know out of out of the out of a cup and and finding new ways to use it <clears throat> so um the first one first thing we'll talk about is is an example of what i would almost call you would call, almost call today like a bottled cocktail uh, there's something known as rum shrub and it is essentially if you look over there on the right um, this is this is a recipe for making it uh, from Clark's Complete Cellarman. It says to make 10 gallons of rub shrub, rum shrub, put five gallons of proof rum, five points of lemon juice, five, or 20 pounds of clarified sugar, or a proportionate quantity of syrup, and blah 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 blah. The 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 idea there is is what are they doing? Is they're they're taking rum and they're adding something sour, lemon juice. And something sweet, which is the sugar, and they're basically making uh, effectively a cocktail. But, you know, it's it's you know the the basis of many many cocktails is sweet, sour, base spirit. <clears throat> and so we have uh, evidence of of essentially what they would call shrubs then, uh, back to the early 1700s. Over on the left there, you'll see uh, an advertised an, a British advertisement from the Stamford Mercury. 1739 and you'll see uh to be sold at their cellar in the marketplace right old jamaica rum jamaican rum was already was already a you know was sort of already a hit by then true cognac brandy uh, we, they spell, spell it differently there at least in, in england and then fine orange shrub uh, and as, as if you look at the newspapers of that era basically rum and rum shrub were Essentially treated the same. They were both they were both high quality products. They were uh, both taxed the same way. It was sort of like you can have your rum neat, you know, just straight rum, or you can have it as essentially uh, a, a bottled cocktail, if you will. <clears throat> and and the, the shrub tradition continues today uh, with the the bottle in the middle there. That's a shrub J M. That's made by uh, the distillery J M in Martinique. It's a beautiful, beautiful distillery. If you ever go to Martinique, you should check it out. Uh, but it's essentially, it's an orange liqueur. You can think of it as sort of being uh, a rum equivalent to say a Grand Marnier or a Cointreau, something like that, but it's made with, with uh, Martinique style French cane juice rum uh, and then other spices. And it's utterly delicious. So like you said, as, as early as, as 1700, we have this sort of bottle, you know, like Rum, or you know, rum, lime, lemon, and sugar in a bottle. <clears throat> now, move forward to another example, which is called pineapple rum. Um, this was also a very big thing. In the same way that you would see advertisements saying, like, here's rum, we have rum shrub, you'd also see pineapple rum as just another varietal of rum. Uh, down at the bottom there, we have an advertisement, 1844. Proof pineapple rum, Wetterburns, uh, and Wetterburn being one of the, the very earliest uh, quality designators. Wetterburn was actually a merchant in uh, in London and made basically imported lots of different rums and sold them. And so Wetterburn rum was kind of a particular mark of high quality. <clears throat> um, but there were many different pineapple rums floating around. As early the earliest reference I've seen is uh, 1779. Um, the pineapple rum is, is even exists in literature at the time. And the most famous example, of course, being the Charles Dickens novel, The Pickwick Papers, and a particular Reverend Stiggins, who the, there's an illustration there in the middle there, particular Reverend Stiggins, who had a particular uh, predilection for pineapple rum. And it was that, um, that sort of story that uh, that story, and in combination again with historian David Wondrich, who led Plantation Rum a few years ago to make a a pineapple rum, it's basically rum that they've infused with pineapple and then redistilled. It's actually it's actually two different rums that they've infused <clears throat> with different parts of the pineapple, uh, and then combined together and redistilled, and it's delicious and it's won uh, won several awards. Um, but it's a it's a it's an old style pineapple rum. Uh, so again, 
it, you know, they're selling rum, but uh, you know, with flavoring in it. So you, you could, people will oftentimes take the stickins and just pour it over ice and, and enjoy it that way. So again, a very early, simple bottled cocktail, if you will. <clears throat> now, around that same era is, is kind of an interesting story that I love to tell. Uh, I'm somewhat of a historian on a British Navy uh, rum history. And uh, perhaps the most famous day in British Navy rum history, at least in the beginning, uh, was, was a day in 1740 <clears throat> when an Admiral Ed, Ed, Edward Vernon wrote something. And a little bit of context before then. It was in 1731 that the British Navy uh, Admiralty decreed that sailors every day will get a half pint of rum. Like every sailor every day gets a half pint of rum. That's eight ounces of rum every day. Um, and you know, that's a substantial amount. And it only took them nine years before Ad Admiral Vernon here decided, hey, this is causing a little problem. We, we have a whole lot of, of drunk sailors and we're not particularly efficient anymore. So it was on August 21st, 1740 <clears throat> that, that uh, Admiral Vernon wrote and ordered to his fleet in the Caribbean this is a, basically these issues may be better remedied than by the ordering their half pint of rum to be daily mixed with a quart of water. And so basically he's diluting it. They're taking the eight ounces of rum, diluting it with 32 ounces of water, basically slowing down how fast the sailors can drink this. Um, interestingly, the officers didn't have to do that. The officers of the ship continued to drink their eight ounces deep, but all the you know, rank and file sailors had to dilute their rum with a quart of water. <clears throat> and that's, you know, and that's the, that's, that was the notion of grog. That's where your Navy grog comes from is essentially um, the adding of, of rum, of water to rum to dilute it. That, that's technically what grog was. It's got that name because Edward Vernon, as you see there on the left, uh, was famous for wearing a grogram coat and the, the sailor, you know, it's known as Old Grog. The, that's where the name came from <clears throat> for Old Grog. The, the lesser known part of that, of that passage and it's continuing is actually what's important here. And he adds, which they that are good husbands may pour the savings of their salt provisions and bread. Basically, they, those who save their money, save their resources, and don't spend it on salt provisions and bread provisions, they may purchase sugar and limes to make more palatable to them. The idea being like you'd get your rum, you'd get your water, and then you could also buy lime and sugar. So you were putting rum, lime, and sugar together. Uh, you could consider this perhaps the very first cocktail. Um, probably a little warm out there at sea. There's no ice, no shakers, no garnishes. But in the context of, of a cocktail of diluting rum and with water and adding flavoring, British Navy 1740 uh, holds a very early claim there. Okay. So that brings us to, you know, I've mentioned rum, lime, and sugar several times now. This brings us to the topic of the daiquiri itself. Uh, daiquiri is sort of the canonical rum cocktail. It's the, it's the, foundation for many other types of cocktails, which we'll, we'll get to in a, in a moment here. <clears throat> but the, the fundamental notion of daiquiri is rum, lime, and sugar. Uh, on the left there, you see what a, what a proper, you know, probably an original daiquiri was like, in that it's, it's rum shaken with ice. It's rum, lime, and sugar shaken with ice. Uh, basically, you could call it a rum sour if you wanted. Um, and then and served up like that. Uh, so, you know, when, you know, when you see a frozen daiquiri, you know, if you walk down Bourbon Street and you see a frozen daiquiri, that came much later and, and cocktail purists don't, don't really consider those slushy daiquiris to be real daiquiris. Um, but that said, you know, a proper frozen daiquiri um, was, was a particular favorite of Ernest Hemingway there in the middle. Um, <clears throat> Hemingway and the daiquiri have sort of become synonymous. In fact, there is a, a special Hemingway, a special daiquiri known as the Hemingway daiquiri. It's uh, much more dry uh, than a normal daiquiri. Uh, Hemingway would consume them while he lived in Cuba uh, at a particular bar called La Floridita. 
uh, which we know today as the cradle of the daiquiri. Uh, they claim that it was that the that the daiquiri was invented there or it was at least popularized there. Uh, so that's a picture on the right there. You can see frozen daiquiris, uh, Hemingway style daiquiris at La Floridita in Cuba. <clears throat> and there's a, a, an actually a, a statue of Ernest Hemingway, who's always at that spot in the bar. Uh, and if you go there, you won't get anywhere close to it because all the tourists will be clamoring around and taking selfies. But um, <clears throat> nonetheless, the daiquiri, which most people believe to have, have originated around the late 1800s, early 1900s, right around the turn of the century, uh, that's considered the start of the daiquiri. And like I said, all most other rum drinks that have lime and you know have something sour in them are considered to be um, you know basically derivations of a daiquiri. <clears throat> now, this brings us to the you know now we're going to jump back again in history, but you know I needed to set the foundation of daiquiri. Um, <clears throat> another early part of of rum and drinking and what you would call cocktails today is the idea of punch. Uh, punch was an enormous, enormously popular way of, of uh, social drinking back in the 1700s. Um, again, David Wondrich literally wrote an entire book about, about punch, it's called Punch. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it, it was a very big deal. It was, it was what people got together to do, uh, and particular men got together to do. Um, interesting story about the punch You'll notice there that each in each of those figure there, they're all very large bowls. And supposedly, as the story goes, is that a group of people got together, they'd make a punch, and then nobody could leave until that that um, until the bowl was finished. So like you were in it for the long haul. You were you were you know it was it was going to be a, a binge punch drinking session uh, for several hours, um, and. Uh, you know, from that area, we, we got from that era and maybe into 1800s, we got all sorts of uh, sort of classic punch recipes. And like, for example, Philadelphia Fish House Punch uh, is one, um, but there are others, you know, artillery punch. And, you know, and sometimes they would use uh, other things like, you know, sometimes they use brandy. But rum was sort of like rum was a very particular ingredient, as was Batavia Iraq. Uh, which is you, uh, as I mentioned a, a moment or two ago, Batavia Rock is essentially a cane spirit made in Indonesia with a little bit of <clears throat> um, red rice to help uh, as, a, as a ferment starter. Uh, so Batavia Rock um, still made today. You can still buy it today. Uh, and you can kind of consider it to be a really kind of a funky rum, almost in the style of a, of a Jamaican rum. Uh, it's quite delicious if, if you love the sort of like Highly flavorful rums, Batavia Rock is, is something else to check out um, when you get a chance. So punch, punch, again, a very early 1700s on forward. Uh, didn't really die out as a social thing until I think late 1800s um, or so. So punch. So now <clears throat> that brings us to another, you know, per perhaps the most famous punch of all time, uh, which is planter's punch. And... Planter's Punch is based upon a, a sort of a, an old school uh, Barbadian nursery rhyme, which which all all um, all tiki lovers and all all um, you know rum cocktail lovers can, can recite off off the top of their head, and it goes one of sour, two of sweet, sweet, three of strong, four of weak. Over there on the right, <clears throat> you can see it written out. And they've, been, and they've helpfully have told you what they mean. So sour being the lime juice, lime or lemon juice are usually your two sours. Sweet is usually your sugar. Uh, strong is your, is your spirit, again, typically rum. And then weak is water, ice, anything to dilute it. So if you look at, think of those ingredients, you essentially have what, what a daiquiri is. You have, you have something sour, something sweet. So those two balance them out. And you add something strong, you add a spirit to it, because you're, you know, you're there to have a good time with the spirit, and then you dilute it so that <laughs> you're not instantly hammered. Um, but that, that notion of, of planter's punch uh, sort of took off uh, in the, I think it's the late 1800s, early 1900s. It was a, a really big thing. In fact, rum brands like Myers 
would say like they are the the planters punch rum that they were those are like effect, effectively implying they were the the official rum of, of planters punch um an advertisement over there on the left is just myers planters punch rum <clears throat> but um but that notion of of um of sweet you know sour sweet spirit dilution uh essentially became um, the, is is the foundation, but then of of these of what you call almost call tropical cocktails. But then there was you know as we'll see later uh, things that derived from them and really sort of took them as a base and then built heavily on them become became sort of the more popular cocktails of the more modern era. But regardless, right now we're still we're still simple. In those days, 1700s, 1800s, early 1900s, very simple drinks. It's like how how can you how can you combine rum, lime, and sugar? Uh, <clears throat> and over on the French islands of the Caribbean, uh, today would be Martinique and Guadeloupe. Uh, the way they drink their their punch, their national drink, if you will, is what they call tea punch, and it is is essentially it is their their style of rum, a, a French cane juice rum or rum agricole as you would call as they call it uh as a, you know it's a rum distilled from fermented cane juice and so it has a particular sort of grassy uh, vegetal note to it it's, it's a wonderful wonderful type of rum if you've never had it it's you should definitely try it but it's essentially what they will do is it's really just you know lime you know rum lime and sugar again uh, and you know you could call it the French version of the daiquiri, although they they don't shake that over ice. They will, you know a true Martinique uh, person will literally just add a little sugar, a little I mean literally a tiny amount of sugar, like a squeeze of lime, uh, and then uh, you know two three ounces of rum to the glass, and then you use that little swizzle stick there. Uh, it's like, I think it's the the lele a bois lele, I think is the name. Um, but essentially, and just swizzle swizzle them together. Very simple, rum, lime, and sugar. That's called a tea punch. Uh, there's an uh, interesting phrase associated with it. Um, each prepares his own death in, in English, which essentially, <clears throat> the, you know, that comes about because uh, on Martinique, you, if you were to order a tea punch, they will often um, bring you a tray and it will literally have a bottle of rum, uh, some limes, a knife, uh, and either either a little little thing of sugar, you know, a little thing for you to spoon out some sugar, or maybe some some simple syrup. Um, you know, there there are arguments over what's better, sugar or simple syrup. But the idea is is you know best what you like. You know how sweet you want it. You know how much lime juice you want. And the rum there is so inexpensive. I mean, it is to this day. It's still very inexpensive. That literally, it's like they don't really care if you pour two ounces or four ounces and pour four ounces you're going to get hammered and it's you know and, and not drink much more so it's it's uh it's just, it's essentially it's a it's a tradition and you you know you prepare the tea uh the way you do it and so it's it's a it's a fun little exercise uh, an activity for some somebody who's never never uh, seen that before so tea punch is a sort of like a, a kind of a daiquiri without without a chilling or whatever but again rum lime and sugar <clears throat> The whole idea of rum, lime, and sugar um, follows through. Um, now we're getting into the late 1800s, early 1900s. You see the evolutions of drinks like the mojito and the caprihena. And they're, they're different drinks. I'm not trying to say they're the same, <clears throat> but they share a certain amount of, of in common. Um, the caprihena is, is from Brazil. Is unaged cachaça, so they're unaged Brazilian cane juice rum or cane juice cachaça, <clears throat> lime, sugar, mint, and the idea is that you is that you um, put the the sugar in the um, hold on, I think caprihena. No, I'm sorry, there's error in my slides there. We I fix that. Caprihena does not have mint. Yeah, fix that. Yes, um, but basically caprihena is, is unaged cachaça, lime, sugar. Um, Forget the mint, uh, but the mojito, you know, and but served over ice. Mojito is the same basic idea: is is, is this, but instead of using a cane juice rum, you use a a light rum. Uh, mojitos uh, being believed to have been originated in Cuba, you would use a very light Cuban style rum. Uh, again, lime sugar. Uh, what you would do with a mojito is that you would um, muddle mint. You would basically put the lime 
you would cut the lime and put the lime and put the put the mint in, uh, basically muddle them together, sort of extract some of the, the lime juice, extract some of the mintiness from it, put the rum in, uh, and then basically add ice and and then soda water. So it's essentially you can think of it as a dactery is a is a lime accent dactery with a little soda water to sort of make it a little more lighter than than a, a dactery. <clears throat> Caprihenia is, is kind of the same idea. There's no mint, and you use and you use a cane juice, um, uh, cacha, unaged cachaca. Uh, <clears throat> but those are very; those became very popular sort of vacation drinks for people, you know, going down to the, the Caribbean and South America. <clears throat> and very, very simple sort of highball style drinks. So now. Um, now we're sort of entering early 19, early to mid 1900s and we get to US prohibition. This is where things sort of really take off for rum. Um, prohibition started in 1920, uh, ended 1933, I think it was December 5th, 1933. Um, but there was a period for, for 13 years of essentially no alcohol in the US. And, you know, you know all of this, I don't have to explain prohibition in terribly much detail. <clears throat> but, you know, naturally the Americans, not all Americans agreed with it and they were going to get their alcohol uh, in any way possible. You know, of course, there was medicinal whiskey, um, which, you know, if you're if you get your doctor to write a prescription, they might get you whiskey. But um, you know, they were the distilleries still weren't making quite quite that much whiskey. They were basic. Most of them were shut down. Meanwhile, off in the Caribbean, the Caribbean islands were were happily making rum and supplying it to whoever wanted to buy it. And so that's where we got what, what we would call uh, the rum runners of that era. And uh, you would see people like a certain William McCoy, um, who, who basically got very good at, at uh, essentially buying Caribbean rum and bringing it basically to just outside of the, of the U.S. Uh, territorial waters, <clears throat> you know, bringing it there and then basically using small boats to bring it into the country. So Caribbean rum became a, a substantial source of, of uh, alcoholic spirits coming into the country uh, in, in the during Prohibition era. And if, if you didn't want to buy illegal rum and you were, could afford to fly to, down to the Caribbean, you could, of course, drink while you were down there. And you'll see over there on the left, uh, that's a Bacardi ad. From that era, basically, like tempting tempting Americans, like come to Cuba. You know, we've got rum, uh, we've got rum, we've got daiquiris, uh, we've got mojitos. You know, and that was sort of the 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 real rise of Bacardi as a rum brand, basically saying like, come to Cuba, the rum flows here. You know, it's not uh, you know, it's this very nice, light, drinkable rum. It's not it's not super heavy and onerous, like maybe. <clears throat> maybe the old English style rums, uh, but, you know, that prohibition, Bacardi and Cuba, you know, sort of hand in hand formed a sort of the juggernaut uh, that they became and still are today. Um, going back to Bill McCoy there, I forgot to add this, uh, but yeah, so Bill, Bill got to be very good at it. Uh, he was famous for not, for not um, cutting his rum, for not adulterating them with, with other spirits, not watering them down. And so as, as the story goes, he, that, you know, his rums gained, you know, gained, you know, higher credibility. People would want rums from Bill McCoy and the phrase, the real McCoy, like this rum is the real McCoy, uh, came into vogue. <clears throat> and we, today, we have a rum brand called the real McCoy. Uh, it's Barbadian rum made at a uh, four square distillery in Barbados. Uh, it's a, basically, it's a, it's an American company that partners with, uh, the, with the four square distillery in Barbados to bring in a line of uh, Barbadian rums called the Rio McCoy. So that's sort of, you know, that's prohibition from a high level. And, um, but also, um, once prohibition ended, that's when things really got interesting for rum. <clears throat> so think about it's, it's, you know, January 1st, 1934, Americans can finally drink again. And oh, by the way, they're kind of in the depths of a recession. Um, they're, you know, he, people are poor. People may not be able to travel as much. Uh, they they need an escape from everyday life. Uh, and I don't believe it's coincidental that the very first tiki bar 
or you know, a tropical bar um, with with uh, elements of, of Polynesian escapism uh, came about. Um, it, you know, it's not it's, it's highly unlikely it would it wouldn't have it it wouldn't have happened any other way. That essentially the end of prohibition birthed what we know is as tiki. They didn't actually call it tiki uh, proper. Uh, for a few more years, but <clears throat> if we look at it, you know, for tiki historians like me, you know, we see 1934 right after Prohibition ends as as the starting point of of the tiki movement. Uh, there were two primary people uh, who are associated with that early tiki movement, uh, and they both, you know, have their place in rum history. Uh, the first over there on the left is Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gant. Uh, who named himself Don Beach uh, for his bar, uh, his, his first bar called Don the Beachcomber uh, in, uh, in California, basically by Hollywood, the, you know, that, that sort of Polynesian escape, escapism and imagery was to a large extent driven by, you know, being very close to the movie industry and set designers and things like that, where they could create that sort of like escape from reality. <clears throat> and so, um, Don Beach uh, opened his first, again, Polynesian tropical tiki bar in 1934, uh, met with a lot of success, started opening more of them, um, <clears throat> and tiki became, you know, over time, tiki became a very big cultural phenomenon. Um, another person uh, is over on the right there, a gentleman named Victor Bergeron, uh, who named himself Trader Vic, and I'm sure many of you have heard of, of the Trader Vic uh, bar chain, a restaurant chain. Um, it's, it's believed that Vergeron was inspired by, by Don Beach, and they were sort of competitors, if you will. They were both, both uh, created essentially rest you know, restaurant tiki bar chains uh, that, <clears throat> that grew and grew and grew uh, from the 1930s on, and, you know, at their peak, they, they were, you know, the peak in the say, uh, early 1950s, tiki was high culture that you would get dressed up. You know, if you look at this, at this picture here in the middle, these are people at a tiki bar and they're not wearing a tropical shirt like I am. That, this came much later. They, were, they would get dressed up. It was high fashion. Uh, you know, people in suits, um, the, the wait staff would, of course, you know, be wearing tropical attire, but people would, you know, go get dressed up. Uh, it was fine dining. In fact, as the story goes, um, <clears throat> when the Queen of England, uh, Elizabeth, came over for her first U.S. visit, uh, the very first restaurant she ate at in America was, in fact, a, a tiki, um, a tiki restaurant. Uh, so it was a pretty big deal. <clears throat> um, so, OK. And the drinks they created were, you know, the drinks like uh, the Mai Tai, Zombie, Jet Pilot, Test Pilot, all those drinks heavily, heavily, heavily uh, depended on rum. Um, and part of, part of that story is the fact that, like, you know, they're starting bars, 30s, you know, late, early 1930s. Rum is much more available uh, than, than another spirit. Rum is, is inexpensive. Uh, rum, was, rum was the engine of tiki, if you will. <clears throat> and and just as an example of that, on this next slide here, we have um, Don de Beachcomber's rum list from uh, 1941. And this this sheet, I mean, look at these prices; they're insane. But um, you know, for example, a you know a Bacardi Cord, uh, Carta de Oro, 45 cents. Uh, there, you know, Lemon Heart 28 year rum from Jamaica for a dollar five. <clears throat> um, but if you look at this, if you look at this list. Is they like these were all rums that he had on hand, and he didn't necessarily use all of them in tiki drinks. But you know, this looks like a modern day whiskey list. There's probably 50, 60 different rums on here. You know, now you go to restaurants and they, you know, a whiskey restaurant, base restaurant, you see 50 or 60 whiskeys. This was a rum restaurant uh, back back in the day. That that, um, that you know, it, it gives credence that, that that this was heavily based and that. They weren't using just the cheapest rum they could find. They were they were actually, uh, if you look, they've got them categorized for where they come from. So there's a Cuban rum, you know, the Cuban rums them for the most part would have been a lighter style rum, Demerara rum, which would be rums from Guyana. Those would be a little heavier, uh, a lot of pot still in it. Martinique rums, 
uh, which at the time were you know, probably still more of a blend of molasses than, than sugarcane rums, probably a blend there. Uh, lots of Jamaican rums, and it's kind of funny, of the number, the number one category of, of rums you see there by quantity is Jamaican rum. And in fact, if you, if you look at the tiki recipes of that era, which I did in my book, said, what is the most common type of rum used in tiki? Uh, it would be Jamaican rum. You know, and then they have other, other rums like Batavia Rock from, from Indonesia, you know, Puerto Rico, Barbados, Haiti, Trinidad, some, some USA rums there. Uh, back, back when the U.S. Had a, had a rum industry before it kind of all fell apart by the, you know, 50s and 60s, you know, came back later. Um, but, yeah, you, there, there's a substantial, <clears throat> you know, focus on rum there. And... Um, and and you can see as well they're 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 different rums because they have different flavor profiles, and they they form a backbone of those of those tiki cocktails that they that each rum adds brings a different flavor, um, and there there's a a saying attributed to to uh, I think it's Don Beach where it's just like what what rum rum what one rum can't do three can. Um, it's, we have, we haven't actually found that Don's actually saying there, but it's a great, it's a great quote, you know, and the idea is that the, you know, you combine, you blend multiple rums together to create a, a flavor base that you then build the rest of these tiki cocktails, um, which in these tiki cocktails are essentially, uh, fancy daiquiris that you, that you, you have, you have rum, you have lime, and then your sugar is exotic, you know, like it's like, instead of just simple, simple syrup, it might be passion fruit syrup, it might be pineapple syrup, you might, it might be a French almond syrup, uh, that is essentially the tiki is, is really that rum, lime, and sugar, that, that core trinity <clears throat> that you've then evolved in many different directions. You've used multiple different styles of rum, you've used different types of juices, different types of spices, different types of, of sweeteners, and so you've created this incredible, you know, incredible fl flavor palette off of the foundation of rum, lime, and sugar. Um, probably perhaps the most canonical tiki drink uh, in the world, I would say most tiki people would call this the, like the, the, the king of tiki drinks, if you will. They may like something else better, but the Mai Tai, a proper Mai Tai, <clears throat> um, is, is sort of you know, the ultimate tiki drink perfection, if you will. Uh, it was invented in uh, 1944, uh, believe it or not, in, in Oakland, California. And it was a, a Trader Vic who writes there, this little excerpt there, it says, I went to service bar in my Oakland. And he says, I took down a bottle of 17 year old rum. It was J. Ray, a nephew from Jamaica, surprisingly golden in color, with a rich pungent flavor, particular to Jamaican blends. Uh, and then he talks about adding fruit juice, fresh lime, orange curacao from Holland, you know, curacao, Dutch, a touch of rock candy syrup, which is basically simple syrup, and a dollop of French orgeat for a subtle almond flavor. Um, he's basically describing <clears throat> the recipe for a Mai Tai. Um, so now it's the rum there. He says it's a J. Ray nephew from Jamaica, 17 year. Uh, many, many of you know this, but for those who don't, that rum, because of its association with the Mai Tai, uh, that rum, basically, they consumed, they, they literally ran the world out of, you know, these tiki bars ran the world out of 17-year-old Ray and Nephew rum, and then they switched to a 15-year-old Ray and Nephew rum, and then it was all gone. <clears throat> um, so a bottle of that, there are like uh, five, six bottles left in the world, supposedly, but a bottle of that now will cost you about fifty to $60,000 if somebody will will sell it to you, and it's it's and it's not because it's such a fantastic rum. It's that it's so canonically associated with this king of the tiki drinks that collectors will will pay an incredible amount of money to to have it. So um, that's the mai tai, and unfortunately, and actually, we'll back up. You see, the Mai Tai, you know, that recipe there is not incredibly sweet. It's, it's actually pretty well balanced. There's, there's an ounce of lime juice in there, and the amount of orgeat and curacao and, and simple syrup uh, aren't so much. It, it's, it's a, every time I make a Mai Tai for somebody, they're like, this is surprisingly, like, well balanced. It's not as sweet as I thought it would be. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, and all the tea lovers, we know this. 
But it's unfortunate that that Mai Tai in the name has been bastardized over time. Uh, you know, you'll notice in this recipe, there's no pineapple juice, there's no grenadine, there's no rum float. It's a very simple, elegant recipe. But unfortunately, that Mai Tai name has been bastardized around the world with, you know, like you go to a bar and he's like, it's got orange juice and pineapple juice and, and cherries and, you know, and any hardcore tiki person is, is just going to say no. And, you know, so we're, we're trying to, you know, slowly us tiki people are trying to, to rescue the Mai Tai's reputation and educate the world about like what a proper Mai Tai is and why it's so wonderful. Um, and, you know, the last thing I'll add on this um, you know, the, the, the Jamaican rum is in the Mai Tai, uh, as, as I like to say, as rye is to a Manhattan, um, as gin is to a Negroni, Jamaican rum is the soul of the Mai Tai. So uh, it just, you know, goes to show again, Jamaican rum is the most common canonical. It is the heart of rum and tiki. Okay. <clears throat> um, around that same era, 1940s, we see, an, we see another cocktail that many people have heard of, um, also known for its prodigious amounts of rum, known as the Hurricane. Uh, Hurricane was uh, believed to be have invented in Pat O'Brien's uh, in New Orleans during World War II. I'm actually in, living in New Orleans right now, so I'm maybe two, mi two or three miles from Pat O'Brien's. Um, as the story is told, uh, during World War II, um, scotch and bourbon and other spirits were in, in short supply. And so the liquor, dis the liquor deal, the distributors would, would, in order to, in order to move this abundance of rum they had on stock, they would tell, <clears throat> basically say to a bar, if you want to, if you want to buy a case of whiskey, you need to buy, I don't know, 20 cases, whatever the number was, but basically you need to buy a whole bunch more rum if you want us to sell you that that case of, of uh, whiskey and so the merchants really had no choice uh they had this ton of rum on their hands what what do you do with it well you you invent a cocktail that has a ton of rum in it and you make it popular and you sell a lot of rum that way um so the hurricane uh the, this you know you'll see variations of it the the sort of the canonical hurricane rim recipe is really is really simple it's it's rum lemon juice, passion fruit syrup. Um, it, it, you know, some people would call it a tiki drink, you know, as tiki purists are like, yeah, it's not really tiki. Uh, you know, it looks like, you know, it looks and smells like tiki, but it's not. Um, but that's sort of a, you know, an esoteric argument for us, for us tiki nerds. Regardless, the hurricane is, is perhaps one of the other most famous rum cocktails. <clears throat> uh, Another very famous cocktail that came about, you know, based on rum, known around the world, known and loved around the world, is Pina Colada, uh, believed to have been invented by Ramon Monchito Marrero uh, somewhere in, in the mid to late 1950s at the Carib Hilton in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Apparently, the bar where he did it is no longer there. It's been renovated. It's gone now. But the, the Carib Hilton is, is generally considered the birthplace of the Pina, uh, the Pina Colada. Um, you will see references to pita and coladas earlier, you know, like in newspaper reports, but it's usually just, just um, like pineapple juice and coconut milk blended together. The pina colada, um, again, very, very simple recipe is it's really just rum, rum, um, coconut cream, Coco Lopez. As, you know, some, some say that um, pina colada came from a competition, like, hey, somebody basically created coconut cream and they needed a way to sell a lot of it. And so a drink that uses coconut cream was a way to do that. So rum, coconut cream, pineapple juice, uh, and ice blended into a, into a smoothie format. Um, it, it's delicious. Uh, it's, it's, most people would say it's not a tiki cocktail. It lacks that, that sour part. It's, it's a very sweet cocktail and it's delicious and they go down very smoothly. Um, but a lot of people say it's not, it's not really in tiki genre. <clears throat> Related, tropical, but not tiki. Um, some spiritual descendants of the, of the pina colada. Um, the painkiller uh, being one. Uh, the painkiller is essentially a, think of it as a pina colada, but with, um, orange juice as well as pineapple juice. And then per trademark is supposed to, it, it's supposed to be um, Pusser's rum in a painkiller. Um, 
And then, you know, and that's, you know, that's quite popular as well. And then in modern, in the modern era, we see people riffing on that pina colada, that base of pina colada. There's a recipe in, in my book uh, called the Angostura Colada by somebody named Zach Overman in Seattle. And he, that recipe is, uh, is essentially, you can think of it as pina colada, but it also has, has a, an, an ounce and a half of Angostura bitters. So it brings an incredible amount of bitter um, that's balanced out by this very rich <clears throat> cream uh, to create to create something that that um, is incredibly interesting to drink. Some people love them, some people just they don't like it. But the point is, is that that pina colada you know, base structure uh, is, is starting jumping off point for a lot of other uh, similar cocktails, you know, based on rum, coconut cream, pineapple, and then other flavors coming into the mix. <clears throat> Okay. And now we get to, um, so we sort of, we've, we've sort of progressed from punch through, you know, punch in the 1700s and then, you know, 1800s and, you know, daiquiris and mojitos and then the rise of tiki. Uh, in the in 1960s or so, tiki kind of fell off the map. It grew, it, it fell out of favor. <clears throat> um, you know, the, there's some say the, that generation who was coming of age in the 60s would rather use drugs than drink alcohol. Um, you know, they didn't want to do what their parents were doing, which, you know, their parents were flocking to tiki bars. Uh, and so, but tiki, tiki fell out of favor. Uh, people started using, you know, pre-made cocktail mixes, not following recipes. It just sort of, it almost disappeared off the radar, like bars, the bars closed. It was, there were very, very dark days from about, you know, mid 1960s through the 70s, 80s, <clears throat> um, early 90s. Um, and then, and then around, you know, late 1900 or late, yeah, late 1990s, um, you, you saw a small group of, of enthusiasts in Los Angeles, birthplace of Tiki, an original place. You saw a small group of enthusiasts sort of like start, you know, looking around through the archaeological wreckage, you know, like seeing the old Moai statues on, on Beverly Hills Boulevard or wherever they were, <clears throat> and start looking, you know, asking the bartenders at the few Tiki bars left, like, what's in this? Uh, but, a, but a crowd of, you know, a small group of them started, started, um, Digging, in, digging into the tiki history there. Um, and that was also coincidentally, or not coincidentally, around the same time that the craft cocktail movement in general came along, that you had, you had <clears throat> bartenders like Dale DeGroff and Sasha Petrosky and people like that who were basically bringing back the notion of, of craft cocktails. I mean, cocktails in general went through a dark era, again, of pre-mixes in the 1970s and bottled cocktails. And, you know, again, around the start of the 21st century, it's like, hey, like, let's revive these old recipes and do them the right way. Let's use good spirits. Let's use good ingredients. <clears throat> let's use proper technique. And so um, as, as the craft cocktail movement started, you know, you also had this sort of interest in tiki sort of starting to come up from below. And, you know, they sort of, you know, assisted each other. And uh, essentially, you know, you can think of tiki as a subcategory of craft cocktails. But the idea was, is like suddenly you had a whole bunch of people who are who are interested in making proper cocktails and great spirits. <clears throat> and, um, and it was only 10 years or so ago um, that, that people were clamoring for, like, you know, these old tiki recipes call for Jamaican rums and we're having a hard time finding, you know, a funky Jamaican rum the way they used to be. Like these recipes call for a particular brand of rum that's not available, but the old people tell us that it used to be really funky, not like the Jamaican rums we can find now. Like we've got an old style Jamaican rum that we can use to recreate these cocktails. Um, and so we got, um, you know, we got, you know, one of those early sort of rums that sort of, you know, reemerged to meet this movement there on the left, Smith and Cross, a traditional Jamaican rum blended specifically because, you know, the craft cocktail movement was calling for a funky Jamaican rum. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the, I mentioned this sort of group of people who, who was driving the rise of Tiki, you know, first and foremost among them is Jeff Beach Bunbury, there on the left, uh, he started writing books about about tiki cocktails, interviewing the old bartenders, 
<clears throat> and and digging out those recipes and essentially started promoting you know tiki recipes done properly and you know jeff became quite famous about you know doing so and he, he lives in new orleans today uh he has a bar called latitude 29 uh, that's the Navy Grog cocktail from Ladder 229 there in the middle. Um, that he he was in you know incredibly important in bringing these old recipes, basically rescuing them from the history's dustbin, and bringing them forward in time. Um, similarly, uh, David Wondrich there on the right uh, was kind of doing the same thing with craft cocktails. You know, so not so much, not really with a tiki focus. But with the craft cocktail focus is like, how do we bring back these old spirits here? Let's 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 recreate these spirits of yore. Uh, and so he's you know he's responsible for you know helping to revive several old recipes, several types of spirits. Um, a great example of that uh, is the Plantation OFTD there in the middle, uh, which is actually a collaboration. It's a, it's a it's from Plantation Rum, but basically a collaboration of several uh, fame famous, you know, either rum aficionados or tiki experts, including uh, Jeff Berry, Dave Wondrich, Martin Kate, uh, Paul McGee, you know, a collection of people are like, we want to make a, you know, a rum that's for tiki and recreates these flavors that, that were, you know, instrumental in cocktails of the past. So, you know, that cocktail revolution in tiki was one part of it. Um, Another part, you know, came about, you know, with rum and the co craft cocktail revolution <clears throat> is we start seeing um, other types of rums that we might not have seen before, but they're, you know, the rum, rum enthusiasts are starting to clamor for interesting rums and bartenders respond by using them uh, in new and unusual ways. Uh, so, for example, you know, bartenders were used to working with, with Blanco tequila or with Pisco, these sort of like fresh, vibrant like unaged spirits in their cocktails. And so bringing in something like a Jamaican overproof rum, which is incredibly flavorful, maybe not for everybody, but, um, you know, I love it. But things like a Jamaican overproof, like rum fire there, or a rum agricole, an unaged rum agricole from Martinique, or a Claren from Haiti, uh, which, you know, had that Claren La Roche there is, has his own just like, out of control flavor that's unlike anything you've ever had before. Uh, but bartenders, you know, in the craft cocktail movement were, were very much like, what new flavors can we bring into the mix? And, and certainly these, these new, they're not new rums, but newly available rums uh, sort of grab their fancy. And so you start, you know, if you look in craft cocktail menu, you'll see much more interesting, you know, cane juice spirits in use than you would have. Um, uh, even 10 years ago. And then, last but not least, um, another part of the, of the cocktail revolution is, is uh, regarding rum, is that the good rum, the high-end rums, the things like, you know, an Appleton Estate rum, you know, an old, old guard, very well-regarded rum, is people started experimenting in, uh, in place, using it in place of other sort of dark spirits. So, you know, think, think bourbon, scotch, uh, cognac, armagnac. It basically like, hey, there's great rums out there of equal or better quality. Like, let's make cocktails with those. And so uh, we start seeing things like the rum old passion, very popular drink. And, you know, it still blows me away that people are like, wait, you can, you can use rum in an old fashioned? It's like, yes, you absolutely can. And it's amazing. Uh, use, the, use the right rum, but it's amazing. Um, Likewise, rum in a Manhattan, you know, inst instead of the rye or the bourbon, uh, you use a nice, uh, nice aged rum. Uh, that cocktail is called a palmetto. Same thing with a Negroni, uh, a, 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 you know, basically rum, vermouth, and Campari in a Negroni style drink called a right hand. They're delicious. Um, and so, like I said, the, the, the craft cocktail revolution has driven a demand for better rums and more interesting rums than what you would have found, you know, 20 years ago on the shelf. So um, we've traveled 300 years of history. Uh, I want to I want to thank you all for for uh, listening to me. And uh, we're going to have questions next. So uh, that's my contact information there. Uh, feel free to send me shoot me an email. Visit my website, cocktail, my website, cocktail.com, and if you want to buy the book minimalistiki.com. So uh, we'll, we'll see you in the questions in just a moment. Thank you.